chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Um, today is Monday, uh, February 27th, 2023, and I call this meeting to order. A few uh, brief remarks before we get started. Um, you know, the CCB has noticed through our inventory tracking and product registration that there are uh, maybe a handful of businesses that were approved for licensure by the board. Um, those businesses didn't take the final steps to actually get their license, um, and yet they might be operating as if they are a license. Um, just to briefly recap our internal processes, the staff here reviews applications and recommends um, that certain applications be approved by the board once they're deemed complete. Um, board approval alone is not sufficient to begin operating. You need to actually get your license. Um, and there's usually a few final steps for licensure that are not required at this initial approval stage. For instance, payment of fees, um, proof of insurance, proof of, of bank account, um, permits from a local cannabis commission. Um, these are the things that we don't want applicants to necessarily pay for. We don't require at the approval stage, but they are required uh, in order to operate. So um, when an applicant is approved by the board, an applicant receives an email with these remaining contingencies that they need to satisfy before we issue them a license. And if you don't provide proof of these contingencies to the board, you're not licensed and you cannot operate. Um, it should go without saying, but if you're a product manufacturer or a wholesaler or a retailer, you can only purchase cannabis and cannabis products from licensed entities. Um, you should ask to see the seller to see a copy of their license, not just an approval letter. Um, purchasing from an approved yet unlicensed entity and then selling that product is either a violation of board rule or a crime or potentially both, depending on the circumstances. Now, uh, we know this is a new industry and that these rules and regulations are new. We try, we strive to take an education first approach, but um, intentional ignorance of our rules is no excuse um, for, for not abiding by them. And um, while we tend to take an education first approach, law enforcement doesn't have that kind of discretion when they have evidence of unlawful dispensing. Um, on a related note, all products being sold to the general public must be registered. And a product is not registered just when you hit the submit button on your application. A product is registered when you're notified from the CCB that it's been approved for product registration. We're all aware that the process for registering products has been challenging and that there is a backlog. We are systematically tackling this backlog and updating our internal processes in a way that should get uh, these turned around much more quickly. For instance, we've integrated product registration into our licensing portal. We've um, subsequently migrated all the submissions from our uh, temporary system into this new system. And we've shifted um, more staff to product registration and review. Um, just like when we had a backlog of licensing applications, you know, we take a first in time, first to review and approve approach. So we will take into consideration certain ex exigencies like perishability um, in our review priority. Um, We've also made a decision that this fall, we're gonna be shifting our testing protocols to require pesticide and pathogen testing of each individual strain or cultivar instead of each harvest lot. We'll be updating our testing guidance documents and there will be more to follow on this, but it's a very important change to keep in mind as you start to plan out your growth for this upcoming season. So I don't have anything else, but Kyle, I know it's been a big uh, month for the Harris's. Do you have a uh, maybe just a quick announcement you want to make? Yeah, th thank you, Pepper. Um, um, for those of you that have tried to, to reach out to me via phone or, or email, I may have been slow to get back to you. My wife welcomed um, a baby boy um, earlier this month, and I've been out of the office doing some paternity leave and, um, you know, just getting comfortable uh, with Finn. He's an awesome little guy and I should be um, back in the office next week but I've, I've joined team no sleep all you parents out there 
I get it now. And to all you future parents, it's uh it's awesome. I will say that. So <laughs> thank you, Pepper. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Um has everyone had a chance to review the minutes from our last meeting on January 30th? Yeah. Is there a motion to approve? Yes. So moved. Seconded. Is there a second? Yep. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, let's move down the agenda. So next on the agenda is discussion and vote on seasonal closure of outdoor and mixed use cultivator license application windows. So, um, you know, we have the authority in our statutes to open and close licensing windows um, kind of at our discretion. Um, I think we all remember last year when we were fighting against the calendar to get outdoor cultivators licensed in time to hopefully eke out at least a partial harvest. Um, you know, it was a tough situation for us. It was unfair for the cultivators and it's something that we're actively gonna try and avoid this year. So um, we have a proposal that uh, has been given to us from the staff to have a seasonal closure, um, a temporary closure of outdoor cultivation and mixed year cultivation um, for a certain period of the year so that um, we don't get into a situation where people, you know, haven't had their plants, uh, you know, start to flower, get ready for harvest when the snow starts to fall. Um, and so that's the proposal. I think the dates that we're thinking of are close the application window for new outdoor outdoor, outdoor cultivators um, at the end of April and then reopen it at the beginning of November, I think is the motion. Um, but Yes, it's actually the first day of December. We'll reopen it, and, okay. I, and I'm going to send this motion to cut it down. Yeah. And so um, I think if there is a motion on the table, we should um, wait for discussion until it's been uh, made and then seconded. But um, that's the general rationale for what we're thinking. And again, this would be for new applications. Um, so if you were, for instance, an outdoor cultivator and you were licensed last June, you could still renew in June, um, but this would be um, for, for new applicants. And uh, and again, it would just, you have to get your application in by a certain date. It'll still take us some time internally to review and approve it, um, but should, there would be a cutoff for when you can get it in and then a cutoff for when we reopen the window. So is there is there a motion? You're muted, Kyle. Yep. Okay. So based upon the board's authority to open and close acceptance periods for applications as set out in rule 1.10, I move that the board close the application window for outdoor and mixed cultivation licenses beginning at the end of the business day, Friday, April 28th, and ending at the opening of business day, Friday, December 1st, 2023. There a second? Second. And so any discussion about this, um, we as a board have not had a chance to really talk about this together. Um, you know, I think the rationale that I laid out makes sense to me, um, but I'd like to hear any thoughts that you might have about this, this motion. So just for clarity, right, closing it in April means that most folks who are outdoor growing are well underway, right? right? Um, They'd be growing throughout the summer and then opening in November means folks who want to grow for the next summer beginning at that point, starting their grow, starting setting up all that, that kind of thing. So really what we're closing it for is a period where people are well underway and operating. That's right. Yeah, I, I think, you know, last year, as you acknowledged, we were willing to work with folks and allow them to get things going before they actually had their physical license in hand. And we need to move away from that. Um, as a board, in my perspective, we need to give folks um, certainty that they are licensed and can can grow. So if somebody is looking to submit an application in July, they probably wouldn't get on the dock until September. Well, what, I'm trying to think logically about this. What's really the point if you can't have any plants in the ground until you actually physically have your license? I think this makes an incredible amount of sense. And just for the folks listening, this this is temporary. You still have what, two or three months to get your license application in. And if as long as it's in the system, it's my understanding, you know, um, as long as you hit submit, we'll work with you to try and get you licensed. But this is 
a recognition that our growing season is finite here and we want folks to have a license in hand before um, you know they put plants in the ground or get them started. Great. Um, any any other discussion about this? No. Nope. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Product registration overview and update. Yes, um, I am glad to provide a, a little bit more information. Uh, I think the chair's remarks at the beginning may, I don't want to be redundant, um, but I will talk a little bit about where we are with product registration. <clears throat> I will also talk about it in the executive director's report. Um, so I'll keep this brief. But essentially, um, the way that we've built the product registration process um, here at the CCB is designed to support <clears throat> consumer protection <clears throat> and quality control of the regulated market. Um, and we are confirming that products meet requirements related to a number of factors, including testing parameters, serving and packaging size limits, potency limits, packaging and labeling. Um, and by undertaking this review, we are ensuring that we are um, keeping the safety of products that are available to the public and the sustainability of the cannabis marketplace. So we did create, um, in order to meet our statutory deadlines for a retail opening in October, we had to create an interim system um, to support that function prior to opening of the retail market. Um, unfortunately, that interim system was somewhat cumbersome. Um, it took us a while to review those applications in that system. So while we were doing that, while we, while we were processing those interim applications, we built um, a current system, our current system, which allows us to process much more efficiently. So um, CCB staff have been processing applications both in the interim system and in the new system simultaneously. Um, but now that the new current system is live, we migrated all of the applications from the interim system into the new one um, to expedite our review process. So um, as of last Friday, all of the data from the interim system has been migrated to the new one. And we have um, been processing, oldest to newest, um, those submissions from the interim system. Um, we anticipate that by the end of the week, every applicant into the old system will be notified whether or not um, their application is missing any information. And also by the end of the week, we should have our first um, report available on our website, which um, consists of a catalog of all of the registered products. So that will be um, eventually a public portal for people to access um, and see all of the products that are registered in the state. Until we have that functionality, we're going to be producing a report um, probably weekly uh, to post on the website. And the first one should be up by this Friday. So that is what I have to say now on product registration. There will be more in, the, in my report. Until those reports are in real time are there things that retailers retailers should be doing um, before they're putting products on their shelves um yes they can for every product that they want to stock on their shelves they should ensure that they have um, the letter that the ccb has issued indicating that the product is registered and that letter goes to whatever licensee registered the product so um, if the cultivator is registering their own flower retailers should ensure that they have that um, message from the board to the cultivator before they stock that product. Okay. I think the next thing on your agenda is my report. It is. Not 
figure out how to drag it over. I think I'm gonna. To find my mouse on my screen. I think it's to move it. Yeah. Uh uh. Yes. Yes. There we The suspense. I know. <laughs> it's so exciting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we did it. All right. So here is um February's uh, CCB ED report. Um, before I get into the the licensing data that I normally start with, um, I have a couple of updates on some other things. So first, um, this is a this slide is a summary of our public engagement that we've engaged in in the um, first couple of months of 2023, um, and then a preview of what we have coming up in March. Um, so all of these events that are listed there um, are after hours events that our staff put on um, and that are open to the public and that are live streamed and appear on our YouTube page. So this is all resources for our for our licensed community. So uh, in February, we had three after hours events, um, a social equity and economic empowerment networking event for new businesses. Um, and one on energy efficiency requirements. And we also had a Q&A session on advertising. Um, in February, we had a networking event on tax compliance and a Q&A session on product registration. And then tomorrow we are having another networking event on licensing renewals. Um, and staff will be there to walk through the process of renewing your license. And then in March, we've got three additional um, events coming up. So developing a plan for your positive impact criteria, that is one of the requirements, both for a new license and for a renewal, um, cultivation technical assistance, and navigating local licensing. So um, just a, a, a summary of, of the work that we've done just in 2023 so far and what's coming up. Um, as I mentioned, staff are available at all of these and they are all held after hours. And attendance is Pretty variable, but um, we we're always at, at at least 30 participants per event, and normally it's much more than that. So we're getting some good engagement um, in for these events. Um, next is an update on uh, hiring activity. So lots of hiring activity over the last couple of months. Um, we've got two new compliance agents that were hired and onboarded in January. And that's Dwayne Tomlin and Andy Shiverfills. They, I believe, were introduced at the last board meeting. Um, we also hired and onboarded Gabe Gilman, our new uh, general counsel, please. Here, <laughs> there he is. <laughs> um, and Olga Fitch is our new director of operations, also onboarded uh, this month. And we are in active recruitment for three positions currently for a uh, licensing agent for the adult use program for a medical program um, technician and for a financial manager for the agency. So always lots of hiring activity going on at the board. This is just a synopsis. Um, next is a legislative update. So um, these are three bills that are um, currently under consideration at the legislature. Um, the first is H270, and its companion is S71. This is a miscellaneous amendments to the Adult Use and Medical Cannabis Programs Bill. Um, the House Government Operations Committee has heard testimony um, on H270 last week, um, and I believe we'll hear more this week. Um, Senate Judiciary Committee heard testimony last week on S72. Um, and H-145, which is an act relating to budget adjustments for um, this fiscal year, 
I think was just assigned a conference committee. Um, so each of these bills has uh, some potential impacts on the board. So I thought I would review them quickly. So the miscellaneous bill, um, H270 is the House bill that's moving, does a number of um, a number of things that would impact the Kansas Control Board. Uh, it sunsets our advisory committee. Um, it amends our the statute on advertising so that uh, CCB staff are not in the position of making judgments about a licensee's subjective intent when we are reviewing ad submissions as we are required to do. Um, the bill also addresses some interest supply chain issues um, by allowing licensees to sell and transfer product to other licensees, which is... I think some licensees would, would indicate that's been somewhat of a problem. Um, and it also creates a uh, propagation license type to allow license holders of that propagation license a set amount of canopy with which to um, grow vegetative starts. Um, and the bill also makes a number of adjustments to the medical program, number of changes to the medical program. Um, and it also removes um, the dual jurisdiction of the CCB and DLL over cannabis establishments that are selling at retail um, paraphernalia that could be used for consuming cannabis. Um, S72 is uh, an act relating to lifting, lifting the potency limits on concentrated cannabis products. Um, what that bill does is that it allows, um, it removes the 60% THC cap on solid concentrate products. And lastly, H145 is the budget adjustment bill. And um, what that bill does is, oops, sorry about that, is it contains um, an authorization for the board uh, to hire staff and an appropriation, corresponding appropriation for the board to create um, essentially a state reference lab for um, the cannabis industry. So um, the appropriation would support the acquisition of equipment, lab equipment, and the authorization for hires would allow us to hire a lab director and two chemists. Um, and that would be a, quite a significant um, change if we did have our own state reference lab, that would allow um, our compliance team to um, do investigations um, much more quickly than we're able to do them now, um, and also allow us to do some auditing of lab results of our licensed labs. Um, and it would ensure that we are able to meet our, um, our objectives to make sure that we are overseeing a, a marketplace with quality products. So um, that is a summary of the legislative. Um, those are the bills that are moving right now. Okay. So I'll move on now to our um, to our licensing data. So all the data that's included in the following slides is current as of um, about Thursday of last week. So uh, first we have our average days from submission to approval. Um, so the first time I think we reviewed this data was at our last meeting. Um, this, this, the, these numbers are pretty comparable to the numbers from last month. So the purple 88 days is um, the average days from submission, from when an application is submitted to us to when we are presenting it to the board for approval for all of our applicants, um, standard applicants. And... 30, just under 40 days um, is the average for social equity applicants. Um, so not much of a change from last month there. Uh, I wanted to um, give the board a little bit of a sense of um, how those numbers compare to other states. So before I go through these um, comparisons, I'll just note that our licensing team is working on reporting um, that would show us how long what our average numbers are from the date that an application is um, submitted as a complete submission to the date we're able to recommend a decision on that application. So we don't have that data yet. So the numbers that I'm giving you, that um, 88 days and 40 days, is 
from the time the applicant hits submit to the time that we are actually recommending them for approval. Um, but all of these dates that you'll see on the slide are days uh, from complete, from when an application is actually complete. So this is a sampling of other states that have um, adult use and medical programs. Um, and these are sort of their statutory requirements for how quickly the agency needs to um, issue a, de a decision on an application. So you can see it goes from 90 days to 120 days, all from um, the time that that submission is complete. So this, you know, depending on the state, could look like anything from four to seven months um, of review time. So we are processing applications much more quickly <laughs> that, than than other states are. Um, so again, this is not a not a comprehensive like audit of what other states are doing, but it is a good sampling of um, what review times look like in other states. Bryn, do you know the size of the licensing teams in those states? So um, the lice the they vary quite a bit yeah. depending on the on the state and uh, the size of the market in the other state. But um, our licensing our so ratio between our licensing staff and the number of licensees is um, around average for the okay. staff to licensee ratio in other states. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, and then I'm gonna go through the these average days to approval based on license type, just, um, and I'm only giving you the types of licenses that we have reviewed in the last 30 days. This is probably information that I'm gonna present to you quarterly from now on, unless the board would like to see it more frequently than that. Um, but there's not a huge variation in these numbers, I think month to month. So this for cultivators, all types of cultivators, um, we're looking at an average of 93 days from submission to approval. Um, and that number is up three days since the last reporting. Uh, manufacturers, Submission to approval is on average 85 days. That's up about two weeks um, from our last reporting. Wholesale, 73.7 average days from submitted to approval. That's the same as the last reporting. Um, retail, 62 days. And that's up about six days since our last reporting. And um, then lastly is our employee ID card, which is um, 59 days. And that is also up about six days since our last reporting. So um, the numbers are are either the same or a slight increase, and a slight that slight increase is likely due to the fact that we are um, down a staff member in our licensing team. So I'm going to move on now. We've got a couple of um, interesting slides about employee ID card demographics. So uh, the licensing team was able to pull some information from our um, employee ID card data to show you what the what what the staff look like in the industry right now. So this is gender, um, self-reported gender on employee ID cards. You can see we're at about half male, 36% female, and then um, a smattering of others there. 1% are identifying as non-binary. So race, um, vast majority, 81% 80, are reporting as white, um, and then some small percentages of non-white or blank or other. And then the average age um, for the employee ID card applicants is 38. So again, that's just demographic data that I probably won't present that every month, but um, we were just able to pull those reports. So I thought it would be interesting for the board to take a look at that. So next, um, we're looking at the new license applications um, by submission status. So in the last month, we've gotten 38 new submissions. Um, that's up about 12 from the number of new submissions that we received in January. <clears throat> and the breakdown among the statuses, so this shows you, breaks it out by status, and this um, status breakout has shifted a little bit since last month. Um, so social equity 
is up a little bit. Last month it was at 27% or seven applicants. We've got 11 social equity identifying applicants this month. Um, economic empowerment applicants are down a little bit from 31% or eight applicants last month. And then the standard um, group stayed the same, uh, but their number increased a little bit. But percentage stayed the same. So here's our submissions, our new um, application submissions by license type. Um, so just like last month, it's the social equity applicants are distributed pretty evenly across the different license types. Um, you can see the majority are indoor applicants and outdoor cultivation applicants. Um, and then manufacturer tier three and tier twos and retails. A few of other things too. Um, here's the number of issued licenses by license type and tier. So we've got 346 issued cannabis establishment licenses as of last week. Um, and we issued 78 employee ID cards um, since our last board meeting. So licensing staff, always quite busy. So this is the slide where we make some estimates, some very rough estimates based on what our field staff are seeing during our inspections. So this is a calculation of where we're at for indoor and outdoor canopy size. So you can see the number, the license numbers um, for indoor canopy. Our, our staff are estimating about 75% of that indoor canopy is being utilized currently by growers and about half of the outdoor and mixed canopy is being utilized by growers. Um, and again, it's likely that that number, um, that utilized number is gonna change significantly over time um, as our outdoor cultivators enter, as all of our cultivators enter their, their second year of growing. Here's our retail location map. I'm gonna um, talk about the retail areas of density next. Um, but this map is a reminder that this appears on our website and it's updated after every board meeting. Um, so you can go and take a look on the website to see where retailers are and where they are coming. So the blue pins are licensed retail establishments and the red pins are applicants. Um, and just a reminder that those red pins don't reflect an exact location. Um, they're just dropped within the borders of a municipality to give an idea of uh, where the density is going to be for retailers. So here are here's the list of areas of, of density for retail locations. There's no real significant change to this list from last month. Um, there's one additional licensed retailer in Burlington this month, um, but the overall number remains the same. So it was 11 um, last month and it remains 11. Uh, one of the applicants in the queue for Rutland was withdrawn, so that number actually dropped one. <clears throat> and then the total numbers for Brattleboro and Morrisville and Derby remain the same. And I included Waterbury and Waterbury Center there because I'm just um, including any uh, municipality or cluster of municipalities that has three or more pending. So back to product registration. <clears throat> Here's the total number of product registration applications that have been submitted. As of last week, it was 1,564. So you can see that um, quite a number, 645 are awaiting their review, um, but 246 have been deemed incomplete, which means that um, the applicant has been notified that their registration application is missing some information and 422 products have been registered so far. And um, this is a sort of a visual representation of those numbers. So, and this includes um, applications for registration, both in the interim system and the new one. That's a huge variety of product. Do we know what other states 
like how many product registrations they have. It, do all, how many other states do product registration, and do we know like how <clears throat> varied their products are? Yes. So I know I don't know exactly how many states do. I know at least two other yeah. states do. Um, I do think their review process looks a little different than ours. Yeah. I think that um, the the review that we're undertaking for product registration is more comprehensive than <laughs> what any other state does. Um, and I'd be glad to provide the board with some details about what the diversity of product looks like in other states. I'd imagine it's probably um, in more mature states, it's probably significantly larger than what we have. Yeah. The next slide shows the kind of type of product distribution. Um, I think, you know, right now that vast majority, um, you can barely see it there, but the light green is flower. Um, so the vast majority of our of our product registrations are for flower currently. And I think that's just um, given the nascency of our market. Okay. Was there another question? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yes, this is all of our submitted um, applica registration applications by product type. So this is not only reflective of what has been registered, but, um, but it's all types of product that are either awaiting review or have already been registered. And concentrates includes both liquid and solid. That's and right. Really, yeah, yeah, so that would include vaping liquids as yeah. well as um, other types of concentrates. What falls into the, I'm sorry, did you say this? What falls into the others category? You know, um, I think that those are, um, I'm, well, why don't I hold off on the other okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard about transdermal patches, right? Yes, um, I think that we have gotten one submission for a transdermal patch, um, but we also have, <clears throat> there are a couple of product submissions that um, have not easily fit into another category and are awaiting review. Okay. Oh, plants, I think also fall into that category. <laughs> a little birdie just whispered in my ear. Um, <laughs> And I do think we have some uh, submissions for seeds as well. Okay, I'm going to move on to our compliance data. I have a couple of slides here for you. <clears throat> um, so as I noted in the, our, my update on hiring activity, we've got an additional two full-time compliance agents now. Um, those those two individuals started in January, so there has been um, some training that's gone on in the last several weeks. So our total inspections um, just for the month of, so we're looking at two months now we're looking at, because the data that I presented to you last month was just our compliance data for 2022. So um, for January to February, we had 159 inspections as of last Friday. Um, 47 of those were retail inspections. So this is breaking out um, to around 20 inspections per week or four per agent. But um, I just want to point out that this really accounts for having two brand new compliance agents since last year. They've been in training, they've been going on joint inspections. So um, that number is probably going to change. And again, about three hours per inspection is the average. Um, for February, the enforcement actions, um, for February alone, we've got four active um, enforcement actions for Category 1 violations, um, and we've got 10 closed investigations or enforcement actions across a variety of categories. Moving on to medical program. Um, so this chart um, is the total patient caregiver registry numbers. Uh, patients are the light green line, caregivers are the dark green line, um, and this is numbers from 2009 to 2022 to give sort of a visual representation of how the program has changed over time. Um, and then this is our just last 12 month data. Um, so active patients as of last Friday for the month of January was 3,583. Um, and that number dropped 20 um, for February to 300, 3,563. 
Um, so a little bit of a drop over the last month. I am going to note that some of that drop off might be attributable to our, um, we are down a staff member in the medical program. So we do have a backlog in processing patient renewals. Um, we are processing them as quickly as we can without our full staff necessary for that program. So um, some of the drop off you see could be attributed to them. If our medical bill passes, by the way, you know, it makes the renewal process just incredibly easy um, for people that have incurable medical conditions. Um, so hopefully the kind of onerous, I would describe it as onerous process of getting a medical card uh, will go away to a large extent, you know, especially for renewals, not new applications. That bill also um, proposes to change the dispensary license costs, right? It does. Um, yeah. To drop it by about half. So I'm wondering, do we have we heard anything from folks about entrepreneurial interest in having a dispensary, opening more dispensaries? Anecdotally. Not, anecdotally, yeah. sure. You know, I don't even, I personally, I don't think cutting it in half, it, I mean, it's just so expensive. You know, I don't think that's enough. Uh, I think it's, you know, what's tolerable right now amongst the legislature as they try and figure out what this new paradigm between having an adult mm -hmm. use side parallel to a medical side, what that looks like. I feel like uh, asking for, for it to be cut in half is an interim step. And, and maybe, you know, just because there's, you know, potentially even more regulation if you're a medical uh, mm -hmm. um, provider, it seems to me like the application cost should be less than a retail. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm going to move on to our staff recommendations for the adult use program now. We have um, three recommendations on social equity status. So first is submission number um, 2958 and submission number 2976. Um, this applicant is applying for two separate licenses um, and, the, and staff is recommending social equity status approval for this applicant um, as they meet the criteria for social equity business applicant as defined in our rule. And then staff is recommending two submission numbers for social equity status denial, and that's submission number 2376 and 2167, um, as neither one of these applicants meets the criteria for either a social equity business applicant or a social equity individual applicant as defined in board. Um, next slide is our list for this week. Um, so the applicants on the following slide have demonstrated their compliance with all the requirements for their license that's set out in statute and rule. And here is our list this week. <clears throat> I am going to note that one, um, one business on this list is actually our first renewal. Um, so Trombley House of Cannabis is um, a renewal. They have um, successfully con completed a tier change. Um, so in the future, when we have, when our renewals are coming in with more frequency, we will have a separate um, chart for you to review renewals. So our list this week, Bottom Farm Company, uh, applying for an indoor tier three cultivation license. Good Fire is applying for a retail license. The Herb Closet is, is applying for a retail license. Giving Tree Cannabis, also a retail license. Silver Therapeutics of Bennington, applying for a retail license. Hero Cannabis, applying for an outdoor tier one cultivation license. Sharp Family Farms, applying for a retail license. Edward Hashhands, applying for a mixed tier one cultivation license. High Priestess LLC, applying for a tier one cultivation license. Burrington Hill Company, applying for a tier two mixed cultivation license. Flying Cactus, applying for a tier two indoor cultivation license. New England Cannabis Partners, applying for a retail license. Trombley House of Cannabis, Mixed Cultivator Tier 3. And Demeter's DG, applying for a Tier 2 manufacturing license. That is your list. All right. Is that the end of the executive direction? Report? It is. Hey, no um, executive session today.
So why don't we, um, is there a motion to approve the recommendations from the staff? I move that the board accept each of the recommendations as presented to us by staff in this meeting. I will, I will second. Any discussion about any of it? No. No, not for me. Very comprehensive, thank you. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Great, all right. Thank you so much, Bryn, um, and the whole team, of course. Yep. I'd like to thank the licensing team who always does quite a bit of legwork to get all the data ready. Um, last thing on our agenda for today is public comment. Um, so why don't we deal with public comment the same way we always do. If you've joined via the link and would like to make a comment, please raise your virtual hand. Um, we'll do our best to call on you in the order that you raise your hand, and then we'll shift the people to join via the phone. Maybe, um, Nelly, if you could help us just make sure we get the order right. Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to just make my public comment today that I'd like to request that the CCB closes the application window for tier five cultivators and integrated licensees. Uh, there is, they are a threat to the market and will encourage corporate interests to try to take hold. Permanently closing these larger tiers will steer our market away from what has happened in states like California, Maine, and Oregon, where larger scale growers have flooded the market, pushing small legacy business owners out. We've seen what overproduction can do in our small market when many farming families, including my own, had to sell their dairy farms. So I'd just like for the CCB members to please consider the longevity of our market and let's cultivate Vermont-owned business interests. Let all of us tier one, twos, and threes um, expand and increase our production and try to fulfill it in a more natural way instead of just trying to fulfill it with a tier four or five or integrated license. Um, thanks for everything you guys do. Take care. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Hello. Um, I'm still trying to get a hold of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development about this uh, contract with a consulting firm. I've been trying to reach them all week and haven't been able to get a response. Um, I'm really curious why that was passed off to them to make that decision and why they decided to hire an out-of-state consulting firm with the former CIA agent in their staff. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Caleb. Hi, I'd just like to say I, I completely agree with what Nick was saying about the tier five and those large license. I think that's going to completely kill the market for for any small business. Um, and also, I, I'm I am also concerned with why we didn't go with a in-state company to do background checks, and we went with an out-of-state company. Thanks for the comment, Jesse. Hi, Jesse with Old Growth Vermont. Um, first, I wanted to thank Bryn and Lauren and the team for taking initiative on product registration. Uh, Bryn, I owe you an apology because I copped an attitude with you. Um, so I just wanted to offer you an apology. I entered into the meeting thinking it was a social equity networking event. So I came prepared with comments and ready to get into the solution. And it was a Q&A. So... It threw me for a loop, but I think it's really important that we keep the good faith between the CCB and all of us uh, business owners. So sorry for coughing an attitude. Um, otherwise, regarding the closing the licensing, I just wanted you guys to consider um, already existing licenses and transitioning to a new property. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have considered this yet. Uh, but we we were about to close last year on a property, and because the housing market was so crazy, we ended up on my father-in-law's property. And we've been really successful, um, and I think we've been really good for the community, but it wasn't 
this wasn't our plan. Um, we've just worked really hard to make it work. So we actually think we're putting an offer on a property today or tomorrow. Who knows what will happen because the market's so crazy. But anyways, I just wanted to throw it out there. Um, I don't know if you guys have given it any thought yet. I haven't thought too deep about it yet because I hadn't considered this possibility of closing the window. So anyways, just throwing it out there for now and then we'll keep rowing the boat and kind of see where we land and how to move forward. Otherwise, thank you guys. And I'll see you guys, I think, tomorrow night for maybe a Q&A on the matter. All right, thanks. Thanks, Jesse. Yep, can you hear me? Yes. All right, um, I just wanted to thank all you guys for all your work. Um, and uh, just wanted to kind of echo what, what Nick was saying. Um, I lived in Southern Humboldt for several years, um, and I you know, watched the downfall of the market happen in Humboldt County. Um, and that was directly caused by large licenses, corporate cannabis and MSOs coming into the state. Um, I just, you know, I've, I've seen this happen again and again in every legal market across the country. And, um, yeah, I think Nick's got a good idea. Um, I think Vermont is a very small state and, um, I just don't really see the need for tier five and tier six licenses. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to agree with Nick and, um, I hope that we can all do our part to ensure the integrity of Vermont's market and, um, Try to make it a market that's for Vermonters and uh, and not for outside interest and outside money and keep the money in Vermont. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Yes. So congrats to Kyle, very exciting. Uh, also, uh, I definitely agree with Nick too. Uh, I mean, part of the tier five business model is to put all of us out of business. I mean, how can we how can we help that? Uh, also, thank you so much for uh, putting more attention to product registration. I think that um, the the cannabis sweet spot is like three to six weeks. I know, obviously, like a longer cure is you know nicer for people who understand more about the process. But the masses of people. They want that cannabis from that three to six week point where the bag appeal just, you know, you really knocks you out and you, you open a bag, and you're, you know, a quarter mile away, you can smell it. That only happens during that three to six week point. I know my Gorilla Glue during that time, it, it pulls apart. It, it looks like a Rice Krispie treat. The trichomes are so gooey and stick together. It's just, uh, it's delicious. Um, and so as we continue to make this Vermont brand, um, and especially when we go national as when we can, uh, it's important that we keep this process as fast as possible because when you add it with the, all the other testing and then the product registration and, you know, next thing you know, the product's not getting on the shelves till eight weeks after harvest and then you miss that whole time. So uh, that's it. And uh, lastly, I think that current dispensaries should be able to sell to medical patients uh, with no taxes. That's it, everybody. Thank you. Welcome back. Thanks, Tito. Hi, this is Wayne here. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I have kind of mixed feelings about the social equity fund being outsourced. I mean, I feel like it's good in a sense that, you know, this company kind of has a lot of resources in-house, but I feel like that money should have stayed in Vermont, and I feel like that money could have benefited social equity applicants better if it stayed in Vermont. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Unmuting. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. I uh, just want to um, go on the record to support um, the uh, closing of licenses, the larger license tiers. And the one thing that I would point out is that 
by doing so, um, you help families to create wealth here in Vermont, as opposed to um, you, know, you know those who already have money making more money, possibly sending it out of state. There's an intergenerational um, effect that happens for Vermonters, and that, that that should be considered as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, like Tito, uh, I, I uh, also think that the medical market would be well served uh, if it could be totally served by your existing retailers. Uh, obviously, like Tito, there's some self-interest there. Um, but um, you know, as a as a probably former medical patient by now, uh, having experienced uh, the medical system, uh, I don't feel that it was serving Vermont's medical patients' needs particularly well. Uh, there is a much larger retail footprint now. Um, if the potency cap bill goes through this year, uh, there won't be anything that a licensed retailer cannot sell that a medical dispensary can. And you know the idea that um, the only thing left uh, really is um, is is appointment shopping, which I mean some people might want, and then retailers could give them that. Um, but I don't think that very many people would. Um, I think it's a not particularly well loved aspect of the medical system that you can't just walk into a medical dispensary that you have to call and make an appointment in advance. Um, and so uh, I would urge you to maybe do a little bit of uh, patient fo focus grouping to find out what it is that they actually want uh, instead of just guessing at it, which is what our legislators have been doing for, you know, years and years. Um, and, um, and thinking about a way to um, let rec shops be rec med shops uh, and serve the entire community's needs. Uh, beyond that, um, just real quick on the the product registration system, I, I, I don't think you really appreciate um, quite how badly it is operating in practice. Um, it is a major supply choke point uh, to the extent that anyone is fully following uh, the rules. And I suspect there are a lot of licensees out there who are not waiting for approval uh, because that approval can take months. Um, I, I've seen it. I've seen uh, an application from October get approved uh, two weeks ago. So, um, you know, we got to find a way to fix it. Um, and, you know, the fact that we are a, an extreme outlier among regulated states in doing it this way um, tells me that, um, you know, maybe we're not doing it the right way or in, in a way that really makes sense uh, from a consumer safety uh, point of view. And, uh, We'll be having lots of conversations about that, I'm sure, uh, in the days and weeks ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have my video off, but can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, happy Monday. Uh, congrats, Kyle. Uh, um, so uh, I guess a couple things, and I'll be brief, um, just sort of responding to what has come up uh, in the meeting thus far. Um, first of all, uh, I will say um, to the previous um, caregiver uh, member-based nonprofit uh, called the Green Mountain Patients Alliance. They've been working with lawmakers, uh, this is for everybody, uh, for over a year now. Um, I urge you to Google them the Green Mountain Patients Alliance. There will be legislation this year, hopefully uh, with some of their policy priorities. Uh, it is uh, vital that some form of medical market is retained. Uh, there are unique needs uh, of the patient and caregiver community uh, that cannot be addressed by the adult use alone. Uh, so there is a reason and a purpose uh, for, for that uh, system. Um, I also wanna add uh, that um, we uh, and the regulars are aware of this. We we are uh, disappointed disappointed to hear uh, the the seasonal closure of the mixed and outdoor uh, license types. Um, we hear this as a uh, resources and bandwidth concern. As we're aware, as everyone's aware, 
uh, your agency uh, is sort of shuffling around resources. We do believe you are uh, understaffed and underfunded, and we are pursuing, uh, and this is in alignment with the product registration issue as well, uh, we will be pursuing uh, Uh, what the agency has asked this year. In fact, we will be in House GovOps tomorrow speaking to expanding uh, appropriations and staff just for product registration. But um, getting back to the cultivation license type decision, uh, we firmly believe it is too early uh, in the market for the agency to be even considering this. Um, we need to consider uh, the legacy community in addition to the current licensees at this moment in time uh, and I, we firmly believe that this decision to temporarily close, um, albeit seasonally, the mixed and outdoor uh, is a mistake, uh, and we hope that it is revisited uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. So I don't see anyone else with their hand raised. Oh, there we go. Yes, yes. Um, I wanted to make a comment regarding the tier fives. I think a lot of people have articulated the concern that you know one, once they're up and running, they'll dominate everything and and threaten the smaller businesses, which I think is true. Um, so I'm definitely on on the Nick and the tier five bandwagon. What I what I wanted to understand kind of preemptively is if the CCB considers this and, and ultimately decides no, we're going to keep them, we're still going to allow them. I'd love to see the modeling that shows how much the market consumes in Vermont, how much of that is being met by tier one, two, three, and so on, and, and justify the room for, for multiple tier fives and, and not threatening all the small businesses. Because I think you guys are doing a great job collecting and tracking data, as we saw in some of the reports earlier today. And, and I think based on what everybody inputs to you through product registration and inventory tracking, I think you have it. I think you, you know who's making how much of what and 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 can can either show yeah there's room for it or no there's not i think a lot of us have been doing some back of the envelope calculations and and show that they can really just dominate the whole market but if you guys feel otherwise I, i'd love to see the modeling that that shows that thanks adam anyone else uh, who joined by the link please just raise your virtual hand if you'd like to make a comment um otherwise if you join by a phone you can hit star six to unmute yourself uh yes hello my name is kevin uh am i in the queue yes you're up oh great thank you um yeah, uh, I'd like to reiterate the hard work that you guys have done uh, trying to get this whole thing off the ground. Um, I definitely want to collaborate with Nick and the other commentors about the the upper echelon licenses and the the need for them or the not need for them. And I'm in the not need category. Uh, I have a different view on it. Uh, more from an economic standpoint. So being uh, from the legacy market, you know, we were able to sell direct to consumer and uh, realize the full retail value of a pound. And now uh, that is maybe half in order because you can only sell it as a tier one grower to another licensed grower and everybody wants their cut. So um, I think that the large companies coming in that have a stacked license uh, is going to inhibit from a very real direct economic sense uh, your statement in the past of wanting the legacy market to, to come to play. So um, you know, when, when you're trying to write up a business plan, is all this worth it for half of what I used to get? Or, uh, you know, conversely, I have to grow twice as much to, to make the same money. Um, that's, uh, I, I don't see the need for the larger ones, and it doesn't help the legacy growers come. 
Uh, that being said, uh, I'd like to talk about the license closure window. I'm a lot more familiar with the distilled alcohol industry, and they have a flat out uh, April 1st period. Everybody renews. And therefore, everybody knows if I'm going to be continue operations, I need to start in, a, in an appropriate amount of time. And uh, when you go to the TTB website, they uh, right up front tell you, hey, it's going to be 180 days for a new licensor uh, license to, to be processed and issued. So then uh, as, a, as a person who is pursuing a new license, you know how to plan appropriately. Uh, so I'd like you to consider that for, for policymaking or uh, it, it would seem a little more streamlined to me if, if you moved to that sort of format. Uh, those are the things I have. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Anyone else who joined by a phone? Just hit star six to unmute yourself if you'd like to make a public comment. Yeah, hey guys, uh, thank you everybody for taking the time to come together and present uh, some very good information and, and sort of like the up-to-date minutes of um, all this hard work. So really quickly, uh, I just want to say as a legacy cultivator trying to forge his way as a small operation and a family business, um, just a further mirroring of, of the top tiers and, and how that can influence you know, the success and perhaps the timeline. So uh, kudos to those folks that uh, aired that. And I just sort of uh, just want to second that. I think it's very relative. So um, I look forward to seeing how we decide. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, I'll close the public comment window. I, re I really appreciate all the comments. Um, you know, I, I'll probably address a lot of them in more detail at our next meeting. However, you know, I, I think when we created our market structure, um, we really didn't know how much entrepreneurial interest there was going to be um, amongst tier one cultivators or tier two for that matter. We really, you know, we created six tiers of each license type and left the kind of top tier closed um, because we wanted to foster kind of a, a multitude of, of smaller cultivators. Um, you know, our tier five is, you know, a tier three out of 11 in Massachusetts, just by way of example. But I think it was always in our contemplation that we might need to close um, some of the, the kind of greater tiers. Um, you know, I think it was also in our contemplation that, you know, maybe a few cultivators would get together and form a co-op with a tier five um, license type. But, uh, you know, you know, to be fair, I think our licensing structure has only been approved for less than a year. I mean, it was in a bill that was in March. And, you know, I think it was in at least my contemplation that would give this market a little bit of time to settle before we close um, any of the kind of larger license types. But, you know, that was, that was just um, some of our thinking when we went into this. You know, I think we tried our best to listen to the to the market, um, to the kind of the legacy market in particular, but all of the kind of needs of this market. And we will continue to do that. And, you know, if there, there's a kind of if we if kind of like what one of the commenters was saying, if we're seeing that the kind of tier fives are just able to kind of operate in economies that make it impossible for tier ones to operate then um, I think, you know, we have this authority uh, to shut them down. Um, sh I should say shut down the new applications for them. Yeah, I agree, Pepper. Um, thank you to everybody who raised that as a, a potential issue now and, and into the future. And I just wanted, to, I can't remember which commenter was asking about it sounded like our supply demand model on how we arrived at certain decisions. And that big Excel sheet is available on our website. <clears throat> it can be a beast to download because it is quite um, smart, 
smarter than than I am, that's for sure. Um, and you can you can work with the model to make a number of different assumptions that you want to make um, to kind of see how certain things as they change might impact that supply demand model. So I just to that commenter who was interested in that, that resource is available on our website. Yeah. All right. Well, again, thanks for everyone who joined and was able to kind of chime in. Um, and uh, we will see you next week and I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>